You talked about this not being a boom time scenario. Can you just walk us through some of the projections you're making when it comes to the Alberta economy and, and, and certainly the energy sector? Well, good, and th thanks for that. Uh, we, we recognize, uh, you know, Al Alberta's had, uh, had a tough time economically the last number of years. So 2019 is, uh, ha has also been challenging, uh, certainly in, in the energy sector. Uh, clearly, we need additional pipeline capacity, bottom line. Uh, our, our budget is based on uh, what I would term uh, cautious, but realistic projections, projections based on uh, what we know today in, in terms of additional egress coming on. And so uh, we're projecting um, 2020 to stay quite flat revenue-wise, but then a very slow uptick in, in uh, 2021 and 2022. You say this is not a budget for boom times, and, and this is obviously something that a lot of companies have had to reconcile with, and we've seen them change the way they think about debt, about acquisitions, about financing in a way that seems long lasting. I'm wondering, has that kind of thinking also permeated the provincial finances and that when it comes to boom times, Alberta may be or should be more aggressive when it comes to savings, diversifying uh, industry exposure. Are, are those the kind of things that, that your government is thinking about, not just managing these next couple of years in terms of finances, but the takeaways and the lessons from this big downturn that started in 2015? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Obviously, uh, our first priority and our priority in budget 2019 was to uh, lay out a four-year fiscal plan that brings this province back to, to balance. Uh, and it does it in, a such a, in such a way that will grow the economy, create job opportunities and opportunities for Albertans, which will eventually lead to increased government revenues. In the long term, recognizing the volatility uh, of uh, our, our revenues in this province, given um, our large ener energy industry, uh, the challenge will be uh, down the road after we bring this province to balance to ensure that we continue to deliver programs efficiently and effectively and ensure that we don't simply again adopt a, a high spending scenario that will leave us in you know in the same situation uh, when we experience an adjustment to the economy. Well let's drill into some news uh, we've been reporting on this week. Uh, as you know uh, we had done our own reporting on layoffs at, at Husky. Uh, there have been some questions about whether other energy companies are headed down that path. Can you, can you give us a sense on what kind of support those employees uh, might receive and, and are you hearing anything about further layoffs within the energy sector? Well, I'm not hearing anything specific about further layoffs. The reality, uh, we recognize the challenges that our energy sector faces. And, and, and quite frankly, the results uh, last Monday in, in the federal election uh, were, were disappointing in that uh, you know, the, the current federal government that we, uh, or the, that we now have after the election is the federal government that over the last four years has simply not uh, supported uh, the projects uh, that we need to go through. Um, in Western Canada, in Alberta specifically. Um, they, they haven't uh, provided uh, strong national leadership uh, on these projects that are absolutely necessary to grow our economy out west, that are absolutely necessary um, for the nation of Canada. So there's no doubt that uh, that, that has cre created some concern and uncertainty in the energy industry. What I can commit to Albertans is that our government will be as aggressive as necessary uh, to do everything in our power to ensure that Trans Mountain does get completed, to ensure that uh, Keystone uh, is moved forward, to ensure that, that uh, our Line 3 uh, pipeline uh, expansion uh, gets completed. Uh, we absolutely need additional energy egress to, uh, to continue to, to grow and support our world-class energy industry. And what does that mean in terms of how you're actually going to get this done? Regardless of your opinion of the federal government, it's the government that you're going to have to work with to get this done. The rhetoric seems very divisive right now between your government and the federal government. How do you get past that to actually work together? Well, listen, we, uh, we ha our federal government has uh, owns the Trans Mountain Pipeline and, uh, and has uh, claimed that it is a priority for them. We will hold them to account on that priority. Uh, and we will, we will work with them as constructively as possible to ensure that that project 
uh, gets completed on a timely basis. Um, you, you talked yesterday, meanwhile, about the crude by rail liability. That's how you described it, that your government inherited. And, and certainly we know there were different opinions out there about whether or not the previous government should go down that road. Uh, but when it comes to industry responses, if I go back to late last year, Steve Lott, who you know, he's a big executive at Canadian Natural Resources. He came on this network. He said, when talking about Rachel Notley with that move, he said, quote, she's exactly right. We need rail here to bridge the gap until Keystone and Trans Mountain are on stream. Do you think that Mr. Lott's assessment was wrong? Well, I would agree. We do need rail. We need every... Uh every option of additional capacity until these uh, pipelines come on stream. However, uh, I, I would argue government is not the right body uh, to be in the business of, of moving, moving crude by rail. The private sector can do it much more efficiently and effectively. And in fact, uh, by the previous government's own business plans, uh, Albertans were set to lose minimum uh, $1.8 billion on that uh, crude by va uh, rail uh, adventure. Uh, we are taking the responsible approach and uh, we're offloading uh, those commitments uh, to the private sector and, uh, and, and our offloading will be expensive for Albertans but it, it will be less expensive than staying on the previous government's plan. Do you have a timeline for when we can expect the announcement of that? You know those negotiations are currently underway. Uh, my expectation is that it's weeks uh, not months uh, that there will be announcements coming soon. And just, I just have a question. Is there any scenario under which the government would consider introducing a sales tax to help mitigate some of the uh, cuts that need to be made on the spending side? You know, uh, we received the McKinnon panel report uh, on Alberta's finances uh, that provided us a path to balance. The most compelling finding in that report was that Alberta spends $10.4 billion more per year on its programs per capita than the other large provinces in Canada. That tells me that to just simply tax Albertans more and spend more is not the answer. We have to learn to deliver efficiently and effectively and bring our spending in line uh, with other provinces before we consider doing anything with, with taxes. Not, moreover, we committed to Albertans in the last election campaign that we were not going to raise taxes. Uh, we're going to make good on that commitment. Travis, we only have about 20 seconds left, but yesterday you talked about Alberta wanting to be part of this confederation. Does that mean you do not support movements that push separatism, like on social media, this concept of Wexit? Listen, we're, we're committed uh, for, to standing up uh, for Albertans uh, during, the, during this time and ensuring that Albertans' priorities are placed on the national stage. Uh, that's, that's going to be uh, our plan and priority over the next weeks and months and years.